What if I told you there was an over-the-counter remedy that had similar effectiveness and far fewer side effects than a major medication class, and that it's also beneficial for your mitochondria, fat burning, and even preventing metastasis of cancer, not to mention that it actually makes fasting easier by increasing ketone generation, hard to believe I'm sure, and maybe even harder to believe that it's humble aspirin. Sadly, aspirin is much maligned. Some will point out some people are sensitive to salicylic acid, but if so, it's almost certain that you've figured this out by now. Mainly, people will talk about bleeding, but this is greatly exaggerated, especially at the kind of doses you would take on a daily basis. And at the end of the day, aspirin is just salicylic acid combined with another miracle molecule, vinegar. What could be wrong with that? Manure is not really that bad a word. I mean, it's, it's newer, which is good, and a ma in front of it, which is also good. Ma newer. Did you just make that up? Wait, you think I'm doing material here? No. <laughs> For those of you without a brave heart, go ahead. Exercise your right to be a coward. When I last made a video about aspirin, I got lots of pushback. Almost as though aspirin was tantamount to taking China Red or something. Some people are sensitive to it, but most people have no issues. And the bleeding risk is much smaller than many people have promoted. And going back to 1968, there's a huge literature on a reduction by aspirin in metastatic cancer spread. Many of the deaths and much of the pain and distress of cancer comes from the spread of cancer from the original lesion to other organs and other parts of the body. So there's a huge literature on that, which I'm not going to take time to put to you. And there's also uh, an important uh, chance of vascular complications occurring in cancer. Something like 10% of the deaths of patients with cancer are allotted to vascular disease, heart attack or stroke. Uh, or something like that. <clears throat> Aspen has already been shown by countless randomized control trials to reduce the risk of vascular complications. So already we have good evidence on that. Metastatic cancer, take my word for it, that there are lots of uh, papers uh, showing that. But I'm going to focus on the number of cancer deaths. Now against those benefits, the major risks in uh, assessing the value of aspirin in clinical practice is the increase in the number of stomach bleeds. Now, the stomach bleeds due to aspirin are an increase. The uh, stomach bleeds occur in the community uh, quite apart from aspirin, remember that. And aspirin increases that risk by a small number. And very rarely, a very serious bleed is into the brain. So let's look at the evidence on that. <clears throat> now my colleague, uh, <coughs> Gareth Morgan, my closest colleague in all this work, pointed out that in the risk-benefit balance, as it's usually done, is simply the number of stomach bleeds is evaluated against the risk-benefit balance in the reduction of the uh, cancer deaths. Now that is unbalanced. Most of the stomach bleeds are trivial. Um, very, very few bleeds are, are serious, really serious. Uh, very few cause death. Uh, but uh, men, when they're shaving, may say, well, I'm on aspirin and it's bleeding a bit. So the number of stomach bleeds is grossly overloaded by trivial and by minor bleeds. So we decided as our first study, that we would conduct an extensive study into bleeding attributable to aspirin with a focus on severity. And we decided to focus on the most serious bleeds, that is, fatal bleeds. So we set up a systematic literature search. Here's the proportion of bleeds that were fatal in those uh, 50,000 patients. <clears throat> in patients, Randomized to placebo, the ulcers and the infection caused about 8% were, 
were serious enough to cause death. In aspirin, the proportion of bleeds is half of that, is only 4%. Now, what's going on? Well, there were more bleeds. There were eight bleeds, after all, in 1,000 patients than those on aspirin, and only five in those on patients. So evidently, the bleeds which were due, which were attributable, rightly attributable to pathology in the stomach, were diluted by further bleeds due to aspirin, and those bleeds were not as serious, and they were not causing any excess fatal bleeds. Aspirin is just salicylic acid combined with vinegar, and these are absorbed separately through your stomach or your intestines. I take enteric coated aspirin not just to avoid possible stomach bleeds, but also to get as much of the aspirin as possible into the intestine, which is where it helps prevent colon cancer. Aspirin works by stimulating receptors in cells that stimulate PPAR alpha, a very important mechanism in the body, which increases fat burning, AMPK activity, and autophagy in the body. Aspirin is also the only readily available AMPK reuptake inhibitor, meaning it will be synergistic with other interventions that promote AMPK, such as fasting. Aspirin also increases the rate of ketone production in this manner, so it will make fasting easier and help you to get the benefits of fasting more quickly. It also decreases appetite, so you won't be staring at the clock, waiting until you're allowed to eat the whole time you're fasting. Aspirin is shown to improve outcomes in people with colon cancer and helps reduce the chance of recurring cancer. Since fasting also helps, anyone predisposed towards it should consider trying both at the same time. I often take aspirin while fasting, and lately I take three to four enteric coated baby aspirin every day, whether I fast or not. For other people more at risk for stomach bleeds, especially the elderly, a more moderate dose of one baby aspirin per day makes a little more sense. And you can skip a day once a week just to make sure your clotting factors don't go too low. If you're on other blood thinners or have any health issues, consult your doctor about your particular situation. Amazingly, aspirin is also shown to inhibit metastasis. That this group found that a long term, uh, a longer term use of aspirin reduced the risk of metastatic spread of disease. And what I mean by that is uh, cancer always affects a primary organ in the body uh, and then the reason that people succumb to cancer is because it spreads to other parts of the body. They found that use of aspirin actually reduced the spread of cancer to other parts of the body. So that's a very significant finding and uh, we, we, you know we'll have to see how those implications play out but clearly once we understand the mechanism for that we could have a, a, a broader impact on cancer care. Lung cancer gets all the media attention, but it mainly occurs in smokers, and younger people are generally smoking a lot less these days than they were in the 50s and 60s. The people passing away from lung cancer today are mainly the people who did the damage back then, and there's nothing much to do about it now. The main killer after that is colon cancer, and this is a cancer that's highly metabolic in nature. A low-carb diet and fasting will help a lot with prevention, but surprisingly, so will even low-dose aspirin. Aspirin is very healthy for your mitochondria since it boosts both autophagy and PPAR alpha, and mitochondria health is very tightly involved with the development and spread of cancer. The reason for decreased metastasis is no doubt due to the effect it has on mitochondria within macrophages, and as it happens, it appears that macrophages actually take in defective mitochondria from cancer cells, and if nothing is done to fix these mitochondria, they inadvertently distribute them around the body, and this is the real cause of metastasis. First, we need to look at the metastatic cascade. So the metacas metastatic cascade is a series of events that underlie uh, 
the origin from any tissue, breast cancer, colon cancer, you know, bladder cancer, all these different cancers to spread around the body go through the same cascade. First, there is a local invasion. So here are the green cells represented as the cancer cells. They become uh, metabolically destabilized, enter their default state of proliferation, and eventually break through the basement membrane and enter into the local tissue. In travisation, now some of these cells have the ability to enter into the blood vessels and then um, uh, um, uh, avoid the immune system and actually suppress the immune system. So su survival and immunosuppressive effects. They also move through the bloodstream and extravasate, leave the bloodstream and form tumors in dif distant organs. And that's ultimately what we call cancer spreader metastasis. So a question is, how can the accumulation of random somatic mutations cause a non-random metastatic cascade based on the epithelial mesenchymal transition, which I haven't talked about, but this is the basis for cancer metastasis based on the somatic mutation theory. It makes no sense. So the question is, how, 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 do, all, how do we explain all of this based on the mitochondrial metabolic theory of cancer? So it, it is linked to the, uh, uh, the macrophage fusion hypothesis. Macrophages, these red cells, are actually uh, guardians of our body. They're wound healing cells. They patrol our, enti our entire body. They enter and exit bloodstream. They, they, they work with the immune system. They are part of the immune system. So when we have an incipient, here's normal epithelial cells. Many cancers arise from epithelial cells. So they become destabilized by any one of the provocative agents. They have destabilized energy metabolism. They're entering their default state, but they are not capable of spreading around the body. Our immune cells come into this micro environment, recognizing cancer as an unhealed wound, and they begin to throw out growth factors and cytokines, which is like putting gasoline on the fire. It stimulates these incipient cancer cells to grow even more, even more disorganized and dysregulated. The immune cells will fuse to put out the, the uh, heal the wound. They'll either fuse together or fuse with the cancer, these incipient cancer cells, thereby diluting the cytoplasm with abnormal mitochondria. Now what you have is these uh, rogue macrophages, former immune cells, they are already genetically programmed to spread throughout the body because this is what they do in their normal function. But now they are metabolically destabilized with a genetic architecture to spread around the body. And that's what they do. They intravasate and they suppress the immune system and they are the tumor cells that will be the most deadly. And they are heavily dependent on glutamine and glucose for their survival. So recognizing that all cancer cells require glutamine and glucose, especially the metastatic cells. Aspirin is also shown in animal studies to induce fat loss. This should not be a big surprise since it increases AMPK and fat burning within cells. So the cell will both burn more energy and more of the energy it burns is going to be fat. People used to use a stack of supplements called ECA to lose weight. And there's many studies showing that this is effective and relatively safe. ECA is ephedra, caffeine, and aspirin. I believe ephedra is banned today because a few people passed away taking very large doses. And it can raise blood pressure and do many other things in the body that aren't pleasant. So I don't really recommend it anyway, especially for people who are unhealthy. Caffeine can reduce hunger, but it also leads to raise cortisol. That means it's likely doing more harm than good in the long run, at least as far as body composition goes. In fact, aspirin is not only proven to increase fat burning, but also to reduce hunger. So I wouldn't be shocked if the reality was that it was actually the aspirin doing the heavy lifting in that trio. While it has not been studied for hunger effects directly, in other studies such as one on aspirin's effect on Alzheimer's, it was shown to reduce hunger as a side effect. Sometimes this is a bad thing, so for the underweight this may be something to be aware of. Aspirin also reduces fever, so you may want to avoid taking it while you have the flu or similar maladies, because fevers are actually a part of the immune system's ability to fight off infections. And if you take aspirin while you're sick, that could reduce the effectiveness of your defense. Regardless, this is a fat loss and hunger suppression supplement 
that actually works and it has very few side effects. Really, it's just the bleeding you have to worry about. It's also dirt cheap, while most weight loss supplements are ridiculously overpriced. They're also usually full of herbs grown in China that are sprayed dozens of times and are full of lead and arsenic. They're less like herbs and more like chemistry experiments. So people who recommend them may not be as smart as some of them seem to think they are. He told you his password? Oh, he didn't think I'd remember it. 1643 is the year Isaac Newton was born. 1879, Einstein in 1968. The year Rodney was born. Never underestimate the size of that man's ego. It's actually AMPK that drives ketone production in the body, meaning aspirin is also a cheap and easy way to increase ketones. And that's also the way that exercise increases ketones in the body, by the way. This is going to be good for conditions like dementia, and it's going to make fasting much easier. I've noticed a difference in my fasting since I started taking aspirin every day, including on the fast days. So it's not just a theoretical effect, but a practical one. We're going to have to create a door. Create a door, you can do that? I can. I currently take three to four enteric coated aspirin a day, but you could just start with one and see how that goes and adjust from there as needed. Enteric coating is not just there for the stomach safety, but also for delivering more to your intestines so it can help to prevent colon cancer. Colon cancer kills more people than any cancer but lung cancer, but that's mainly driven by smoking. Aspirin is also good for COPD, which is a lung condition liver disease, fat loss, increasing ketones in the body, and stopping cancer metastasis. In fact, there's probably a lot more things, but I didn't want to spend all day looking up more and more studies. The dangers of aspirin are highly overblown, but tend to become more serious with advanced age and with certain medical conditions. So consult your doctor as necessary, especially if you also take other blood thinners. Aspirin is also shown to be a safe and effective blood thinner that is much safer than other options, so that is something to consider with your doctor too. Once again, thanks to all the people who liked the videos and all the people who've joined the channel. I now have a Bitcoin address in the description now, so you can also send Bitcoin if you like, and thanks so much for all the generous people who have given support in either through Bitcoin or other means. I really appreciate any support, but don't feel obligated, especially those of you who have tight budgets. Believe me, I can relate. I've definitely had to massively scale back since 2020 myself, and that was before the current issues that I have going on. You're having parental issues. You're having parental issues. Senator. What, Freud would have said the exact same thing. Except he might not have done that little dance.